All right, we're back. So this video will be about the KE70, but I thought I'd drop in a little bit of an update about the KE25 as well. And you can see that this 3D print came out perfectly. But this is bang on. Cam wheel came out amazingly well. Fits on, all good. You can see if, I, if it's not too tight, not going anywhere so we're ready to go for this as well which is pretty sweet actually this is probably the first time I've designed something in quite a while actually that I'm quite happy with I think this is pretty good I will drill out and tap this by hand this smaller thread um, for the securing bolt onto the crank and the main reason is because of the orientation of the thread and also the size of the thread it doesn't really lend itself to the type of 3D printing that I'm doing here. Also, it's just so easy to just drill it and tap it. There's no point messing around. Whereas this thread on the top here is a 30 mil thread. Um, and even if I wanted to do it, I don't have a die for a 30 mil thread and I don't particularly want to set up the lathe to cut a 30 mil thread. So here we are. Anyway, K70 stuff. Oh no, wait, I forgot. Also, this came. So I am actually 95% of the way ready to go for the K25 timing, but I don't know, do people, people like unboxings, don't they? It's so weird. I don't, know if, I, don't know, I don't know if I'm like offending the audience or something, but I don't know why you would watch someone unbox something. I don't, maybe someone can explain to me why that's exciting, but um, I opened it. Uh, this was on top and we've got some instructions and we've also got a calibration card to show that it has completed quality control checks and you can see hopefully i might have to edit in a photo of this it might be easier uh your error permissible error is one micro one micrometer through one revolution can be 10 micrometers um, whereas the error on this one was negative 1.6 uh, up to plus 3.6 and through two and a half revolutions it went to plus 13 and plus 6.2 so nothing no amount of error that I wouldn't create myself through what I plan to do if you wanted something more accurate than that you can buy a gauge that's more accurate but you'll pay for it this one was about I think this one was on sale normally I think they're a hundred dollars and I got it for seventy dollars maybe um, you want a really good one, $300 at least. So get what you pay for. But horses for courses also, this tool is perfectly appropriate for the job that I plan to do with it. It is. And you can see the operation of this one is very nice as compared to this one. Who would have thought? But actually, so the, the extra 5%, I said we're 95% of the way there. This one attached, you can see here, this clamp here mounted onto the, mounts onto this shaft. And when you do this down, obviously it clamps onto this, holds it in place. But you can see that this is fixed through this bolt here that comes through and that's what, that's what the wing nut secures onto. And that this here is what's holding the dial gauge in place. However, even if I wanted to mount that gauge like this, um, the diameter of this shaft is much smaller than the Mediterio one, so it won't work. Um, and perfect opportunity to design something new. So um, I'm going to do a design that's pretty much a combination of this design and what was used on the previous dial gauge, but you'll see that in the next video anyway. And not only did I buy the gauge, I also bought a little extension rod. Hopefully you can see this. I don't know if you can. You're probably not going to be able to focus on this. But on the end here, you can see that that's pointed. Hopefully you can see there's a tiny little ball bearing in the end there. Um, and that obviously allows for slip on the end there. So there's no drag or bending or anything like that. And this piece unscrews. This extension goes in between. And then that end obviously screws on to this end here. Another thing that wasn't present on the other gauge, which just had a flat little stopper on the end which is perfectly acceptable for a whole bunch of other jobs but not the one that i'm doing okay let's go k70 stuff all right so it's time to cut this board which i'm recycling 
So often you'll see people use MDF. This is obviously particle board, chipboard. MDF, probably chipboard as well, but I know for a fact that there are carcinogens in the glue in MDF. Um, so keep that in mind and always wear a mask. And I often get from people is why do you bother putting things in CAD so much, so often and so much detail? And one of the main reasons is repeatability. So if this design was in CAD and then I made changes to it, those changes would be kept in the CAD data. Whereas I've just got this one paper template and then I make changes and some measurements are hard to modify. So for example, this radius, it's not even really a radius, is it's more of a spline. Um, in CAD, it'd be a radius and then I could easily adjust it and I could move the center line up and down and left and right. And I could more easily create a symmetrical item. Whereas doing a one-off thing, um, obviously it's not quicker, it's probably slower. So it's more in terms of repeatability. And that logic also applies to CNC machinery. So if you were to have something CNC'd, often it may be just as quick, if not quicker, to machine it by hand or manufacture it by hand, you know, using a hand operated mill, lathe, whatever it may be. Whereas if you're then gonna go make 100 of them or 1000 of them, or you wanna iterate the product, that's really when having the data as digital data becomes very advantageous. To be 300 mils down, I actually watched the previous video more closely when I was editing it. And because I was too busy talking smack, I made a tiny little mark like I did just here. Um, but there was already the mark from the existing line. And so when I was talking smack in the previous video, I lined it up to the existing line instead of the 300 mil line. So that's how I made that error like a dummy. But like I said, everyone makes mistakes. Anyway, that's enough of that. Let's cut this bad boy off. I obviously need the saw on the other side of this line because this is the piece that's gonna drop off and I'm gonna use a circular saw because I've got one. If you don't have one, use a hand saw. Nothing wrong with that. Something else that you need to account for is the thickness of the blade. So if you're gonna put the blade directly on your line, even if you got it in perfectly in the center of it, if the blade's five mils thick, then you're gonna be cutting it two and a half mils short. And if you're on the inside of the line, you're gonna be five mils too short. So I'm cutting on the outside of the line. This is the wasted material here. So the blade is on this side so that I still have 100% of the material that I need over here. Ear wig check. Safe. Safe. Lucky. Magic. So now let's mark out the template. So I left a bunch of extra material on the bottom, as I said, because like I've said a thousand times already, you can cut it off, but you can't put more back on. So now that's cut out, I'm going to remove this template. And you can see where I've traced it out and I'm gonna get the jigsaw and cut these out. Again, you could do this by hand. You could use a coping saw. Uh, you could use a regular saw and then you could file out the excess. Plenty of ways that you can do it. So we can already see this is looking pretty good and when I tip that up we can see that it gets in there nice and close follows the profile pretty much exactly as we wanted so the only thing now is that when I put the piece of paper in you can see that it fit underneath this gap nicely here and you'll be able to see that those two holes don't line up with what's there pencil in and mark them we can see how far off we are there and there. I mustn't have had it quite straight just then. But uh, we've got a couple of choices. So I could cut more off the top here so that it would allow this board to go further in and more closely fit that profile there, which you can kind of see what I'm getting at uh, when I say that. Alternatively, I could just cut out this section here and then it would fit in even further. Let's see what it looks like with the battery on there. Pretty good, I reckon. So I can't show you underneath the car very well at the moment because I don't have a hoist, but basically this is another part of the frame rail here. Obviously there, as I mentioned before, 
so we're good to mount in here. So I'm going to mark it on the cardboard template and then I'm going to transfer it to the timber template because I can rub in these ribs <laughs> here uh, and I can determine a pretty good spot for the holes. So pretty sure these are actually tack welds here from the chassis rail underneath. So we know we need to be on that side of those anyway. Let's do it. I'll measure in how far that is, but I'll put a rough mark anyway. Another thing I just did was get underneath the car and make sure that where I'm going to drill through is not going to hit anything. There are both fuel lines and brake lines on that driver's side, right hand side there. Where I marked it will miss where they were, but just to be safe, I've moved it over about 25, 30 mils. Let's make it 130. Line straight up to the top from the other mark before, and we're about 138. Let's move that to be 140. I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but we are bang on. I can fold this in half and do the same again. Check it with the template first, and then if I'm happy with that, I'll drill these holes. Actually, I've changed my mind upon looking at it a second time. I've used the template to mark it in the boot, and then I've chosen some spots that look more aesthetically pleasing, and I'm going to mark them out and then drill them in the boot. Then I'm going to put the timber on top, mark it from the underside so then I can drill through the holes and it'll be identical to what's in the boot. Again, if I was doing this the other way around and I was doing it on CAD first, I would make sure that the template is perfect because I'd want it to be repeatable, whereas this is just a one-time job, so it just needs to be right in this car. This is just a cheapo rasp from Bunnings. It's probably like $5. No means an accurate measurement, but I'm just going to try and get it as even as I can to this back edge and try and make it look square. So I've picked two spots that I'm going to measure from and tried to get this pretty straight. Get it back in the same spot again in case it moves. Underneath the car, put the pencil up and try and mark both of those holes. So I also gave it a bit more thought overnight as well. And I'm going to stick with the holes that I drilled because obviously I drilled them this morning. Um, but I could have also chosen to put some rivnuts in the existing holes that were already there. However, like I showed on the template, those holes are already quite close to the edge of the board, so weren't really going to work anyway. So I'm going to start with some M6 rivnuts. It could possibly go to M8, but I think M6 is going to be fine. But if you don't have a rivnut tool, you could still just use bolts. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but I have got one, so I'm going to use it. So for the M6 zinc uh, Riv nuts, we need to drill it out to a 9mm hole, so I'm going to do that now. I haven't seen a Riv nut before, basically this is the tool, and essentially what you're doing is you're adding a threaded sleeve to a hole. So this threads onto the tool here, there's all different sizes for different threads, and basically this goes into the hole obviously, and so you'll have your, if we're looking at it like a cross section, we've got the piece of metal here, when you compress the handles together, you're pulling the thread in this way, and then it will bulge and basically create a flange. There's already a flange on this side, create another flange on the other side, secure it in the hole, and then the knurls will stop it from turning. So that's the idea. And these are not very expensive either, guys. I think this is about $100 on eBay. So I use my big boy muscles to get in here, so I'm gonna block the camera. Ugh. That was easy. One thread. Alrighty, so now you can see. Yes. Yeah, Alrighty, there we go. That's in there pretty well. Now that I've decided to go with the riv nuts, I don't have an issue with drilling through to the center of that frame rail and putting another riv nut in there as well. So now that this is fixed in place, I will be able to drill through this and add a third point because three points make a plane. Um, I've screwed that down pretty tightly so you can see it's sort of tucked back at the back there, but. I'll back them off just a little bit so that I can line this up nicely. I'm gonna put a third hole probably about there. I'll double check where exactly. Put a third hole in and then it'll be time to work out where I'm gonna mount this. Alrighty.
So what I would like to do now is counterbore for both of these holes. So you'll need a force in a bit for that. I'll show you that shortly. So that the bolt heads will be completely hidden when I put the carpet over the top here. And then on the back side, where these mounting holes are for the battery tray, I'd like to recess this in to the bottom of the board there and there and weld some studs onto this. Obviously you don't have to do that. You can just put some bolts through um, and you could raise the board up and you'd be fine. But this is how I want to do it. All right, so it's a new day and I'm going to create the recesses for the bolts and also the strap for underneath. Just a cheapy forcing a bit set and a forcing a bit is basically what you use to create a square bottomed hole or counterbore um, in whatever material you're using. And predominantly these are used for timber, otherwise you'd use an end mill for uh, steel. So I've got some oversized washers for the M6 bolts and these measure about 18 mils. So I'm gonna start with the 19 mil bit because they go up increments 12, 15, 19 and 22. So I'll go to 19 first and see how we go from there. So I should say that ideally you'd use these in the drill press. I do have that cheapy drill press that I could put this in, but I can't actually get the board deep enough in the throat so that I can reach far enough down to, to get to that bit, to get to that hole there, which is classic. Um, so ideally if I put in the drill press, I could get the exact distance. And obviously I'll just be eyeballing this with the hand drill. So it's obviously not a big deal for this job, but it is something to think about. Never actually used one in a hand drill before, so I'm just going to do a little test piece first to see how we go. You can see I'm already not straight. Hopefully see there that that is completely recessed. Now that they're done, I will change to a 22mm bit so that I can drill out the radius for the strap on the bottom and then I can router out the excess. The thing that I'll mention which you probably would have noticed before is that um, before drilling these holes ideally I would have just had a little point there or a very small pilot hole so that this can't wander so far within this hole. So just another thing that you could do better next time or that I could do better next time um, just to make it a little bit more accurate. All right, so life caught up with me today and that's all I've got time for for this video. But you can see in the next one, I'm going to be ready to go with K25 stuff and we'll finish off that boot install. Thanks for watching.